Well, welcome. We'll go ahead and start. And if anybody else comes, they can join in. Um, let's open with a word of prayer and we'll get started. Lord, we give you thanks for this beautiful day. It truly is a gorgeous day outside. We give you thanks for the wonders of creation that surround us all the time. We give you thanks for your love, which is always there for us when we need it most. And I give you thanks for all these people and and their willingness to grow in your word. We pray now that you would watch over us and guide us and keep us during this session and as we go through the week. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the book of Jonah. Actually, this is one of my favorite books to do some talking about. It's a very interesting, I think, book among uh, the Old Testament. Um, first of all, you know, we classify Jonah as a prophet. But how is this different from all the rest of the prophets? Anybody have ideas? Well, my Bible says there's no collection of oracles in verse against Israel or foreign nations. Right. So we, Jonah is the only one of the books that we call prophetic that really don't have much in the way of word, the word of God that the prophet actually tells people. <laughs> um, it's mainly a story about the prophet Jonah. So it's a story about his life. Um, it's read as um, on Yom Kippur uh, within the Jewish community. Um, it's been popularized in art and theater and children's, you know, this is probably one of the better known children's biblical stories um, is the book of Jonah. Um, anybody have any idea when we think it probably was written, put together, whatever? Well, it describes events that take place during that period. Um, so the prophet is, the story is set during the time of um, the rise of Babylonia, because mm -hmm. Nineveh is in Babylon. But a lot of people think that probably the book itself is, comes from a time after the exile. Um, because it's dealing with issues that are part of the post-exilic community. So um, if you look at the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, they're dealing with the aftermath of the exile. And their position is that the Jews should separate themselves from other people. That, you know, part of the problem we had in the years before the exile was we got involved with these foreign countries and they corrupted us. And so the best thing would be if we just don't associate with them anymore. In fact, within Ezra and Nehemiah, you get the, um, you get the kind of injunction against to all the people who have married foreign wives, divorce, send them away because we want to keep ourselves pure from these people. Well, Jonah seems to be a counter argument to what's going on in Ezra and Nehemiah. So it's dealing with that issue of what do we do about people who are outside of Israel? How do we deal with them? How do we think about them? The character of Jonah, there is a person called Jonah who appears in, um, I think it's 2 Kings as a prophet to the King Jeroboam, who you remember is also the king that Amos <laughs> is talking about. But in 2 Kings, the prophet Jonah is telling Jeroboam, well, your military campaigns will go fine and you'll take over these lands, is giving Jeroboam kind of this rosy picture of what's about to happen. So that's a very different. Are you still there, Cindy? Oh, I think we lost Cindy. <laughs> Hopefully she'll try to get back in. Um, but uh, so we have the image of a prophet, Jonah, who then seems to be used as the character that's central for this particular story. Um, so while the setting is in the question, uh, and he's like back. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> You're back, Cindy. Good. Yeah, good. <laughs> um, so um, it's a satire, the book of Jonah. It's really comedic. And we'll look at some of the, the comedic quality of this book. Um, 
So any questions or thoughts before we begin looking at this particular book in the Old Testament? Well then, let's jump in. <laughs> and you can all follow along as I read the first chapter of Jonah, because this is kind of like the first act of the drama that's going on. Um, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amtia, saying, go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah sent out, set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, so that he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. So you should know that Nineveh is to the east. Tarshish is about as far as you can go to the southwest. <laughs> so he's going in the opposite direction. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried to God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. The captain came and said to him, what are you doing sound asleep? Get up. Call on your God. Perhaps the God will spare us a thought so that we do not perish. The sailors said to one another, come, let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And what pe what people are you? And of what people are you? I'm a Hebrew, he replied. I worship the Lord, the God of the heavens, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is this that you've done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them so. Then they said to him, Well, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. Tempestuous. He said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then they cried out to the Lord, please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it, as it pleases you. So they picked Jonah up, threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, made vows. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So, what do you think? <laughs> what strikes you about this, this story that's told to us about the prophet Jonah? Well, it's today. Okay. Those people in the street are causing us to have bad luck in our country, and so you, they, we have to get them out. You know, a scapegoat. Okay. We're looking for a we look for scapegoats, certainly. Yeah. I look at the the men on the boat who were didn't believe in God, mm -hmm. and yet they worshipped him after and <laughs> prayed to him. Very good. That, that's a great observation. A big piece of what we have in this first chapter is irony a juxtaposition of the one who's supposed to be the prophet of God and a bunch of pagans. So what you have is that in the, in the structure of this story, what happens here is that Jonah is first of all called by God. And most of the prophets, when they're called by God, even if they're not particularly happy <laughs> with the call sometimes, and some of them aren't, go. 
He went in a different direction. But he went in the opposite direction. Now, if you go a little later in the chapter, how does he identify himself? I am a Jew who worships what? The Lord. The God of heaven. Who made the sea and the land. Who made the sea and the land. So if you worship the God who made the sea and the land, what in the world makes you think you can get on a boat and get away? <laughs> it's an incredibly stupid approach to things this prophet takes. Okay, you know, I'm going to try to go by sea and get away from the God who controls the sea. That's not probably going to work out real well for him. But okay, so he gets on the boat. And one of the interesting things is, um, I'm trying to find in my notes here. Somebody had a really interesting thing that I'd never thought about. Um, because again, the image is an interesting image. Um, so God calls Jonah to rise up and go to Nineveh. That's in fact the terminology that gets used, rise up. And, but he decides instead to go down to Joppa to get on a boat and then go down into the hull <laughs> and go to sleep. So while God's calling him up, he's going down as far as he can to get away from God. Again, this incredibly silly sort of understanding of things. Um, so one of the questions might be to ask, why doesn't Jonah want to go to Nineveh? Well, he's, he's afraid of what will happen to him when he tries to preach to them. Okay, so one thing at this point in the story, we might say, it's because he's scared. He's scared of what's going to happen to him. How do most of the, pe the people who are Jews um, think about the Assyrians, think about people at Nineveh? And I was wrong when I said Babylon before. This is the Assyrians. Nineveh is the Assyrian capital. So it's even earlier than Babylon. So we're way back at the beginning, really. Um, so how do they think about Assyria? Well, they're the enemy. Okay, they're the enemy. And they're even more- They're unclean. What? They're, they're unclean. Okay, they're unclean. Mm -hmm. They're not part of the Jewish ritual structures of things. But even more, the Assyrians are notorious for their use of physical and psychological terror tactics to control the people who they control, um, including Israel. <laughs> During their eighth century campaigns, um, the Assyrians inflicted punishments of disfigurement, and death on their opponents. Um, they, especially on regional leaders and resistors, they left places in economic ruin after they'd gone through the country they were in. Um, so there's a secondary thing that goes on, and we'll get this more clearly as we move into to the fourth chapter. For Jewish people to hear um, that, uh, that God wants to send a message to these people who are just terrible, <laughs> it's like, well, why don't you just strike them down? Why do they need a message? Because usually when a prophet goes to a place to declare destruction, what's the purpose? They can behave. To get them to turn around, to, save them. to get them to repent, to in essence save them. So what we'll find as we go on in Jonah, that that's much more the problem than just being scared of the Assyrians who probably aren't very nice people. Um, but instead, why would we want God to give them a chance? <laughs> These people are awful. What we want God to do is just wipe them out. That's what we want God to do. Um, so he resists this call. Now you get to these ironic juxtapositions um, that we talk about here. Um, so Yahweh, the God of earth and sea, sends a storm. The reaction of the sailors is what? Terror. Terror. Get rid of the cargo. Get rid of the cargo and? Save themselves. 
And look for a reason. Look for a reason and pray to their gods. It may not be to Yahweh. It may not be to Israel's gods. But the pagans immediately realize we need to have God's help. We better start praying to our God while Jonah refuses to pray. So the pagans immediately turn to religious understandings, the hopes of somehow getting God to pay attention to them while you know Jonah just sits there and doesn't do anything. Then when they discover that it's Jonah, that's the one who is um, who is the cause of all this. Jonah does what? Gives himself up. Well, he says that, yeah, it's me. And what does he tell him to do? Throw me in the water. water. Which does what? You know, if you threw somebody into the water, then you're essentially a murderer. They're guilty of his blood rather than, you know, somehow turn around and say, well, why don't we just go back to Nineveh? I know that's what God wants me to do. He instead is willing to let them become responsible for his blood and take on that guilt rather than do what God calls him to do. And what do the sailors do then? Well, they throw him in. Not right away. Eventually. What do they do first? Oh, they tried to get back to land. Yeah, they roll them all the harder. They say, "No, we're not gonna, we're not gonna kill this guy. That's wrong. Mm-hmm. We're gonna go and try to get to land because that's the responsible and reasonable and humane thing to do. We're gonna turn around and try to get to land, but they obviously can't. So they get to the point where they have to throw Jonah into the to the ocean. But what do they do first? They, well, they pray to them. pray for mercy. They pray for mercy. They they say, God, we know that you're telling us to do this, but we also know that killing somebody is really a bad thing. So please forgive us. Well, the Israelite prophet <laughs> refuses to talk to God at all, refuses to listen to God at all, is willing to let other people be guilty of his death. They immediately turn to God and say, we're sorry. We know this is what you want us to do. Um, please forgive us, and they throw him over the side. And not only do they do that, then when they get to land, they offer sacrifice. They become people who are faithful to God. They, uh, they, so we have what's supposed to be <laughs> the faithful prophetic person of God who does everything opposite of these pagans, but who is the one who's doing the right thing? The pagans. The pagans are the ones who are doing the right <laughs> They're the ones who are actually being faithful, honest, good people, while the prophet is being totally the opposite of that. Um, and has no sense of asking for forgiveness. So in essence, what we have is this picture of the prophet of God who's so opposed to what God does that he's willing to die rather than go back to Nineveh. But even in his effort to die, what happens? He can say he's thwarted by God's hand who sends a big fish to swallow him instead. And he doesn't die. So the faithfulness and concern for the stranger shown by the non-Israelite sailor far exceeds that of the prophet who is supposed to be God's person. Um, And in fact, one of the interesting things is one person I was reading, and I never thought about this way, they rebuke the prophet who refuses to rebuke the Ninevites. (laughs) So they're actually more prophetic than the prophet at this particular point in the story. Um, So many have argued that for readers in all ages, well, first of all, let me ask you, what does this then say to us? If we're gonna take this, this first part of the book, 
anyway, as well, it's, it's, throughout the Bible, I always see God choosing just the most unusual people to do his work. <laughs> yeah. And so here were pagans mm -hmm. and not educated, probably. And yet they turned, they atoned. Mm -hmm. And, but they did his work. They threw him in. Yeah. So the pagans are the ones who end up doing God's work. God's work. In its day, this book challenges, first of all, the Israelites to look beyond themselves. Okay, so you think that you are God's chosen. Well, maybe that's not the whole story. Isn't everyone chosen? That's part of what Jonah is arguing, that the whole purpose Israel exists. If you go all the way back to Genesis, Jonah is really arguing that what was said at the beginning of Genesis is what is actually the will of God, that Israel is blessed, why? What's Abraham told at the very beginning when God shows us him? You will be blessed to be a blessing to the nations. This is not about you alone. I'm using you as a vehicle <laughs> for my work in the world. You exist for that purpose. It's not that you Israelites are better. It's not that you Israelites have it all together. And so, you know, I'm choosing you because you are the best of the best of the best of the best. No, you are not. <laughs> you are just the people I choose to use at this particular point in time. Um, and that's certainly, you know, a blessing to be able to be that, but realize this isn't about you <laughs> and your greatness among the nations. And in some ways that becomes a challenge for all of us. Whenever we want to exercise nationalism, we think our nation is better than the other nations or xenophobia where we think, we shouldn't be around other people or particularism or one of the people I read talked about it as something that, you know, part of the dialogue that's been going on in our nation for a while now, exceptionalism. I've heard a few political leaders, both in America and other places talk about, we are exceptional. <laughs> we are, you know, in some ways above the other nations of the world. We are above other people. We are um, superior. Very full of themselves. <laughs> well, it's more this kind of national pride is a good thing at one level. But when it goes to the level then of excluding everyone else, then we've reached this point that the book of Jonah is really talking about then. Is that really what, you know, and that God is on our side? Not on anybody else's side, <laughs> but is on our side. Then that's the place where the book of Jonah begins to challenge people to think about. Is that how God thinks? that this place, these people are, are more my people <laughs> than any of the other people in the world. Um, so contemporary, a lot of contemporary scholars, contemporary people who look at the book of Jonah, view Jonah's rebellion as a kind of counterpoint to the post-exilic idea of we're better and we need to keep ourselves separate from everyone else. Um, and instead begins to look at the universal view of, you know, God loves everybody <laughs> from all different places and may manifest God's presence, as Jackie said, through all kinds of other people. <laughs> So wake up and stop 
holding that kind of view that we are the chosen ones of God. Um, but it also has a sense in which it, it does allow people also to struggle with the reality that, you know, what do we do when those who have oppressed us for years and years and years um, turn around and are blessed by God? What do we do with that? How do we deal with that? Hey, that's not that's not the way it's supposed to be. We're right. supposed to be the better ones. Where is it? You know, God's supposed to love, bless us, not those people over there. How do we deal with that? Well, we're human, so we're angry. Yep. Jealous. Rebel. Yeah. I, I just see a, just a lot of humanness in uh, our reactions to things. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can go through this Bible from first to last page and still think, uh, that guy's a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things I witnessed when I was still working, um, there'd be a job cut some, somehow. Yeah, the company I worked for did a lot of job cuts. Mm -hmm. And the first reaction is, what about me? Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a very, you know, even if I wasn't the one that lost my job, how is this going to affect me? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. And yeah, and from the very beginning of Scripture, from Genesis on to the end, the very center of sinfulness is what? Selfishness. Selfishness wanting to see ourselves as the center of the world. So Eve is tempted by what's, what's, what will the fruit make you? Oh, well, the snake, uh, like God. Like God. I want, you know, ultimately at our heart, there's this piece of us that wants to be God, that wants to be the center of the universe, that wants to see everything spin around us. Yeah. <laughs> um, and when the world doesn't work that way, we become frustrated and angry and jealous and hateful and all the other things that ultimately it seems that what Genesis says, and Jonah to a certain extent takes us to the same place, is that the center of our sinfulness, the center of our brokenness, is that sense of seeing ourselves as the center of the universe. <laughs> and making everything, you know, so when we steal, what we're saying is, I'm the one who can make the choice about who owns what. I'm the center of it all. When I lie about someone, I'm saying, I have the right to say what other people are like, what other people are about. Um, when I murder, I say, I have the right to take the life of another person. <coughs> you know, always at that center is that, you know. So an interesting piece I read was by a scholar named Chen Nan Yu, who um, finds that in God's compassion toward the Ninevites, what we have is something that addresses Christians who see all other religions as incapable of being good, as incapable of somehow being a place where God works, who disparage um, the relevance of any non-Christian voice in the world. He notes that it's not God's prophet Jonah who is depicted as devout and religious in Jonah 1, but the pagan sailors. Considering this and Jesus' willingness to break social boundaries and commune with the others of his time, Chen promotes Jonah as a vehicle, the book of Jonah, as a vehicle for overcoming Christian attitudes of exceptionalism. 
of walls being drawn, that exceptionalism that has impeded our ability to speak to other people of religions, other religions at times, and have led to all kinds of atrocities against those who Christians have seen as less than. So we kill the Muslims. So we kill people who we call heretics. So we kill the Jews. So we kill anybody who is outside of our little so let's then move on at least and quickly begin to take a look at chapter two. So Jonah finds himself inside the fish. <laughs> um, and we then have in chapter two, the record of his prayer. What does Jonah say while he's in there? So then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God from the belly of the fish saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. And then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountain. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought me up, my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. As my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out on dry land. <laughs> I've seen a like, PBS special of what, what type of whale could possibly have done that. And I think finally they got to the, there is a large whale on that part, but, but a dolphin pushed him. <laughs> you know how dolphins can, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But now that you read this, mm. this is not what he experienced in the water. This is where his life was going, mm. down in the depths. I was caught yeah. by the root, um, yeah. reeds, and, you know, mm. and he was saved. Yep. I mean, that's the first time I... Yep. So we have this image, really, yeah, of Jonah is entering into, in some ways, you know, the images are images that Hebrew, the Hebrew people had of the underworld of death. So here he is, you know, essentially at death's door. Um, and he cries out to God at that point as he's dying. But the interesting thing is he cries out, but he's the one who said, well, throw me in the ocean. <laughs> What were you expecting? Um, <laughs> but in the face of death, I suppose all of us, no matter who we are, suddenly find ourselves crying out for deliverance, crying out for some possibility, you know, beyond all of this. And God hears. So God, you know, saves him from death. And then... Of course, it's kind of an ignominious sort of <laughs> salvation. You get vomited out on the land. <laughs> and here you are. So, so what does this say about us? What does this say to us in the midst of all of our... He's going to save us. Okay, but you know, we can cry out to God in the midst of even the most awful moments, um, praying that God would um, make a difference, would speak to us. Even though in chapter one, he went the other way. Yep. God, now, it's, now it's about him again. Yep. Now, save me. <laughs> we think we know what we're all about until we get to that moment when everything kind of comes apart and God offers us life. We pray for that ability. 
Um, it's so different in some ways from the rest of how the book of Jonah has Jonah kind of playing out this whole thing. Uh, <laughs> suddenly, here's the faithful Jonah kind of crying out. Um, um, but praying and calling out is kind of the theme of the whole book. The whole book of Jonah? Jonah. The whole yeah, book. you know, the, the <laughs> pagans cry, cry out. Uh, Jonah now cries out. And as we move later into the book, Jonah will cry out to God again, but not with pleas of please help me, but what instead? Anger, frustration with God. <laughs> Why did you do this? I don't get it. You know, Jonah is this vacillating character who, first of all, doesn't listen to God, then prays that God would save him. Then God spits him out on the land, you know, has the fish spit him out on the land in a minute. Then God will say to Jonah, okay, go. I know I saved your life. I had you spit out here. Go to Nineveh. <clears throat> and Jonah will, but does he really? <laughs> yes, the, you know, we'll, and I think this is kind of where we'll end up for the week. Um, Jonah will go, but not really go. <laughs> uh, you know, and yet out of Jonah's half-hearted efforts, God will again bring about something amazing, something transforming, something powerful. Um, Jonah won't be happy with that, but that's what will <laughs> And again, there's these questions of how do we, how does this speak to us in our kind of, you know, God calls us to go out into the world with God's love. And we do, but not always with all of our heart. <laughs> there are limitations to what we're willing to do, but God moves beyond our Kind of. <laughs> well, I think God says, trust in me. Mm. And that's where we kind of stumble. Yep. So day to day, well, I've got to go to work. You know, trust in me. I'll be with you. I'll yep. be with you. Well, we also put limitations on what we want God to do. You know, we think we know the best way. <laughs> Um, for God to do things. And when God does something we don't expect, we're kind of less than thrilled at times with how God works. Um, okay, I'll tell you something. And it's, it's what God, how come I'm not rich, blonde, and have big boobs? Nope. <laughs> yeah. Those are the kind of questions we ask. That's just what I want to know. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, I, I love the, I don't know who told this story. I, I'd have to look it up again. I used it in a couple of sermons, but um, it's a story about a missionary. He spends his life doing what God wants across the ocean. And now he's going back home. He gets on a, on a boat and, um, you know, the president happens to be on the boat. Teddy Roosevelt happens to be on the boat with him. And everybody is making this big deal. The boat lands on the, you know, at the docks. And all these crowds come. They pour up and take pictures of the president and everything. And he and his wife go home. And his wife suddenly noticed he's really grumpy and angry. And so she asked him, well, what's wrong? He goes, you know, I gave my whole life to God. And here's this president who goes off in a safari somewhere and everybody comes and takes pictures of him and he gets this big welcome home. And what about me? You know, I, nobody notices that I'm back home now. And his wife tells him, well, go in the other room and have it out with God. <laughs> Cause I really don't want to listen to it anymore. So he goes in the other room and a few hours later he comes out and he seems to be of a totally different sort of mindset and, 
And his wife goes, well, what happened? And he goes, well, I did go in and tell God, you know, I'm really upset with the fact that, you know, I come home and nobody pays attention to me at all. And God said, well, you're not home yet. (laughs) So, you know, we have these visions of how God ought to be running the world, you know, and I know I, there have been times I'm wondering, God, why are you doing it this way? (laughs) It could be so much better, but do I really know? Do I really have the insight and the ability to be the one, you know, sometimes I have to stop and say, I'm really glad that God's handling it all. (laughs) <laughs> I heard a Lutheran minister speak, and he said that that we have enough food on this planet to feed everybody in the world. We do. It's just the logistics of trying to get the food to the people. Yep. But if you think about it, there is, he's right. Mm-hmm. And so when we look at starvation... Yep. That, that kills us, and we say God, yep. and he said, well, I gave you everything I you need. You, here's your food. <laughs> I gave you everything you need. All you have to do. Um, but yeah, and that is a reality. It, it's, um, you know, in, in my devotions for this week, and I'll kind of end it up here, I've been talking about justice. What is justice? And, you know, I look at our dictionary definition of justice. Our dictionary definition of justice is um, meeting out punishment and goodness based on a series of laws or whatever, an equal sort of way. But that's not what justice is in the Bible. Justice in the Bible is right relationship and right, and right distributions of resources based on relationship. And justice in the Bible has to do with God often takes, says that justice is about speaking for the most vulnerable in society. It's not about everybody getting the same amount. (laughs) Sometimes people need more because they are the most vulnerable. And that justice demands then that they be the ones who are cared about most. Justice also in the Bible includes mercy. It's not justice if mercy is not involved in the process. So the biblical understandings of justice are radically different. God understands justice totally differently um, than we do. So our cry is always, it's not fair. From when we're little kids, our cry is, it's not fair. (laughs) Well, you know, justice, God's view of justice isn't fair. And we should be thankful that it's not fair. Because if we all got what we deserved, here. <laughs> we would be in huge trouble. <laughs> huge trouble. <laughs> and, and really, Jonah's, the story of Jonah is about that reality. If, if you demand that God be fair, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> It could be really bad if God was fair, but God is more than fair. Um, And maybe we and our interaction with each other need to be more than fair sometimes. So I'll leave you with that to think about for the week and we will get back together in a week and finish up the book of Jonah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here.